so much, Nicole, and welcome everybody again to Coffee Connection Live. This really is a special one for us. I know every parent in the world right now is wondering about what to do when school starts this year. So we're really happy that you're here with us, whether it's evening for you or morning if you're on the other side of the world. Thanks for being here with us. And I'm so excited to have Jessica Rudd here with us. Jessica, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, as you get started, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, how you met your spouse. And while you're talking, I would love for everyone in the chat box to tell us where they're joining from tonight. Yes, thank you so much. I already see people I know in the chat, so this is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, my name is Jessica Rudd, and I met my spouse um, about 15 years ago because he needed a date to the birthday ball. So uh, <laughs> started a relationship that way. Um, we have three kids and a German Shepherd. Um, we've lived back and forth, East Coast, West Coast, many deployments. Um, and I currently uh, I've worked with Deloitte here in the DC area. And right now I'm training for a half marathon that I'll be running in October. Wow, so you've got quite a bit on your plate. <laughs> I also happen to know that you're the 2017 Military Spouse of the Year for the Marine Corps. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how does that all come together? Yeah, um, so I was actually nominated um, by a friend, and she told me about, um, I'm going to nominate you for the Military Spouse of the Year. And I'm like, I, I don't know about that. I'm in the grocery store, and I'm thinking, I, I no, that's not me. But then I realized that if she saw something in me, um, and she's been tracking what I've been doing, then maybe what I've been doing has been impactful. Um, so I can kind of use that and pay it forward. So with that, um, I accepted the nomination and I won the base level and that was when we were at 29 Palm. Um, and then I went from there to the top 18 and, and won that and then ended up winning overall for Marine Corps. So it's just been a super great honor and such an amazing experience. That's awesome. And congratulations to you for that. Um, so you're married to a Marine, but you are also a Marine yourself. Um, I'm curious to know, how did your time on active duty prepare you for parenthood? Oh, okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I am a veteran as well. And I think my time on active duty has um, helped prep me for the little sleep that you get. As a parent, I think I probably got maybe more sleep um, as a Marine than a parent um, with little ones and, and, you know, so yeah, I mean, time management, the Marine Corps was so kind to us, it, you know, continues to provide for our family, but um, it's definitely helped shape me into like how we parent today. Awesome. Well, thank you for your service. And um, it sounds like you're a fantastic spouse and, and a great mother. So I want to I wanna get right down to the reason that we're here tonight, because we've had more interest in this topic than just about any other topic we've ever covered before. So we're here tonight to talk homeschooling. Let's get into it. Um, I'd love for the, the spouses who are joining us in the chat box to, to let us know if you're already a homeschooling parent or if this is just something that you're exploring right now. Let's, let's, let's get a little conversation going in there about that. Um, Jessica, did you have any experience with homeschooling before you got started with your kids? Or was it something that you just always wanted to try? Um, no, I didn't. So I never thought I would ever homeschool. I don't claim to be um, an expert. I'm not a teacher. Um, but my husband was homeschooled and I saw how you know, he is a successful person in society, and um, I think people just don't understand it. So as I'm looking at his experience, talking with his mom um, about how they did it, um, we looked into it more, and it just kind of fit our family for the school district that we were currently in, our lifestyle at the time, and kind of how we wanted to school our kids. So we just kind of won it. <laughs> All right, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so there's a lot of parents out there who I, I'm seeing the, the chats kind of come up, they're doing it for the first time. So um, what's a good place for parents to start? If they're thinking about homeschooling, what, what's a good place to start? Do you, do you have questions that you asked yourself or are there places that you went for research or to find answers? What's, what's kind of square one? Right, so I think um, everyone has that on their mind right now and you're gonna start big picture and then narrow it down. Um, I say right now there's probably three categories that everyone's looking at too when you're trying to decide how you're going to um, 
school your kids right now and whether it's alternative learning, virtual learning, um, homeschooling, traditional homeschooling. And I think that's where you wanna see where you fall in right now. Are you doing the um, virtual learning provided through a public school system? Are you, um, you wanna try something new, you know, not getting answers and kind of just um, wanna go off on your own and do more of a traditional homeschooling? Or there's other resources out there such as charter schools and homeschool co-ops, um, which give you a little bit of a blended thing, but still not through um, a public school. So, you know, ask yourself, you know, what you're gonna do. And then from there, you can start narrowing it down to well, what am I gonna use to teach them um, and, and things like that. So now you said you have three kids that you homeschooled. Are they all the same age or were they in different grades as you were schooling them? Okay, um, that's a great question. So they were different ages and we homeschooled for about four or five years. Um, and so they were littler at the time. And I had um, a preschooler and then a kindergartner and a third grader. Um, but I mean, they were kindergarten for second, third. Um, towards the end is when I had my last. So that's when um, I've seen lots of questions already come up with, what do you do with the younger ones? <laughs> Um, so yes, I was schooling different ages, um, different stages, which can be challenging. And I, I know a lot of people have questions about that, so I'm excited as well. So we can get into that in a little bit about the different ages. Yeah. Um, I'm a parent who has always said, you know, I can't even get my kids to put their clothes in the hamper at the end of the day. How am I supposed to teach them algebra or, you know, European history, things like that? I, I'm not the teaching type. So what advice would you have for parents who sort of are in my shoes where they don't, they're, they're not sure that they could do it. They're not sure they're up for it. What, what would you tell them? Right. Um, I would say you definitely can do it. Um, if you have taught somebody at some point in your life to tie their shoe, to ride a bike, to make pancakes, I'm sure that you can do it. Um, but it's not always pretty. There's tears on both sides that we've experienced. Um, it's not like this, you know, um, it's, there's good days and bad days. But you really don't know how much you can do until you actually do it. And um, I think that's where a lot of people are stuck right now because a lot of people haven't had um, an option, which that's one of the biggest reasons I wanted to do this is because I really empathize with multiple sides of I'm choosing homeschooling. I, I have to do this out of necessity. I um, am working. So um, I would say this at least might answer some questions for those who um, have doubt. Um, so at least maybe we can get some resources when you're, you're asking yourself, I've never homeschooled, how can I do this? So you, you touched on parents who are working and may not have a choice. Um, there are a lot of parents right now who work full time and are working full time from home, um, but they've also got to make time for homeschooling their kids. So if a parent's working eight hours a day, how would we be expected to homeschool for eight hours a day? Is, is it a full day, like when the kids go to school from eight to three, or um, maybe, maybe I should just say, can you break it down for us a little bit? What does a typical homeschooling day look like? Okay, no, that's a great question. So um, my experience with doing traditional homeschooling is we had the flexibility to kind of make our own day. Um, what I love about that style is if my husband was coming up on a deployment, we would do school on Sunday and um, my kids would never know. And then dad might be home on a Monday or we would be camping at the top of the mountains in California in a tent. And they're doing school there. Um, we would regularly work through some holidays to kind of make it work to our schedule. However, let's shift over to you're doing the public school system, which I did with the kids this spring. Um, it's a little more on their time. So you're doing Zoom meetings on the teacher's time. What I've been doing, what I seem that's worked for me is number one, my work's been super helpful and supportive of me working from home. Um, and then I'm finding pockets of time to do a little bit of facilitating during lunch. Um, we might have to start school earlier. But homeschooling is not an eight hour venture. You're not doing worksheets after worksheets forever doing eight hours. I mean, if you take out some of the stuff that they do at school, most states, work, the minimum is about four hours a day. So you can break that up into like a two hour thing in the morning and focus on your language arts and math, take a break, go on a walk, nap, 
um, whatever you need to do, and then maybe re-engage in the evening. Um, as much as it might suck, you know, you're taking away a little of your time, um, but maybe you have another spouse or, um, you know, friend that's there. So I think the big takeaway is it's, it's not a whole day. Um, we're not trying to make it another job on top of your job. Um, and there's ways that you can kind of work around um, your work schedule as well. Okay, that, that's good advice. <laughs> what about for parents who have, we talked about the multiple school age, but also some kids who aren't in school yet. Mm -hmm. How do parents focus on, on homeschooling when there's also a baby or a toddler that's demanding their attention? Do you have some tips and tricks for that? Yes. So little, little ones, I, I usually wore, you know, in a ergo, something of that nature, sleeping. Um, those are actually pretty easy. Um, but what we did is we kind of set up an area. And I think I had this big picture that I was going to have a dedicated homeschool room and we we're going to have desks and I was going to get on Pinterest and do all this crazy stuff. And what actually worked out best for us was being at our, like our bar top in the um, kitchen area. And then it was, you know, a tiled floor. So my son would play Legos or Play-Doh and I'd have to get him engaged in an activity. So part of my lesson prepping was what activity I'm going to give him today that will keep him busy for 30 minutes so I can teach this new concept to the second grader who's actually learning like material. Um, so those are the tricky things and you need to figure out what works for them whether it's little, um, you know, tactile hands-on things, Legos, um, a tablet, I mean, we all do it. Something like that to keep them engaged while you're getting them on the right track. Okay, so it's just a little extra step as you're planning their, their lesson plans for the day is just considering what to do with the youngest or the one who needs alternate attention, right? Yeah. Okay, you're laughing because we just saw somebody write not kinetic sand in the chat box, right? <laughs> I'm sure there's a story there. Sure. Um, you had mentioned, and and I, I should I should pause and just say when when everyone registered to to join the discussion tonight, we asked them if they had questions for you. So I'm I'm intertwining some of those now, um, and we're also going to pause in a couple minutes and ask for questions live from the audience. But I want to I want to get to as many questions as we can. So you had mentioned setting up like a dedicated homeschool room in your house, and I've heard a lot of military families who I know have that room, they have the extra space in their house. Um, what are some other things that people need to consider, whether they have a homeschool room or not? Um, what kind of supplies do they need to have on hand? Is it like where you go to Walmart and you get the school supply list? Um, what, what are some things we should have on hand to get started? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I ended up using was just cabinets. I had some extra cabinets and we would just put things away and pull them out every day. Um, really basic things. We just needed um, workbooks, lots of pencils. We used flashcards, um, a printer. You know, we, we did print off some worksheets and stuff. That was um, that was really helpful. And then there's also our curriculum, and we can get into that later. But as far as just supplies, I mean, real real basic things. We would go to the Dollar Tree and just you know pick out some fun things because we don't need binders for every single subject. Um, you know, it depends how organized you are, what grade they're at. But for most of the elementary stuff, um, pretty simple. And then you can find out what you need along the way. Do you find that it's, you said cabinets and my mind immediately went to, do, do you find that it's, it's better to have the act of putting it away at the end of the day and taking it out in the morning so that it's not like your school stuff is just always out on the dining room table. Um, sort of like the act of going to school and, and walking home when your kids are in school. Did it help your kids to have like the, okay, now we're taking out our schoolwork and now we're gonna put it away at the end of the day and be done with it? Yeah, so I'm sure there's some people in here who, who can relate who work from home. And I feel like it's important to have a dedicated workspace. Um, so there is a little bit of that separation. for So for us, um, you know, the cabinets were, you know, the children could reach them. Um, so it was something that they could put away and put back out. And it was like, kind of like, okay, we're done with this for today. Um, go put away your stuff. And, and then it was just kind of, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Okay. Um, so we can start to talk more about curriculum and, and specifics. Um, 
but even outside of that, we, we've heard about these homeschool co-ops where groups of homeschool families get together and they have outings and they have lessons. Um, right now, during the pandemic, um, are there anything, any, any kinds of activities you can recommend for like socially distance outings with other homeschool families? Um, yeah, so how, how we did it, I was um, part of a homeschool co-op in 29 Palms. And we, we did that similar structure. We kind of did our own thing during the week. Everyone did their own curriculum, whatever you did. And we met once a week and it was more for like socialization. We would meet up and do like a science activity or arts and craft, um, a very broad um, activity all the kids can do together. And we would take field trips. Um, I would say that I know that some museums are opening up back, um, opening back up now. Um, is those kind of things you can do, social distancing. Um, we would go to the zoo and we would print off a zoo scavenger hunt. And, they, and the kids would have to like check off if they found a zebra or check off if they found a mammal. Those kinds of things are fun to do and you can do that social distancing. It's outside. Um, nature walks, same thing, find different things. So I would say you can still get out and engage in a safe way with masks in the open when it's not as confined where people touch things. Um, and start re-engaging in some of those things. And that's just up to everyone's comfort level as well. I love the zoo. My kids love the zoo. I feel like I could go to the zoo every weekend. We love it. Um, I'm going to pause there because I do see that we've got some, some questions coming in. Um, Nicole and Trish, what do we have in the chat box? And uh, we're ready for the first question when you have it. Yeah, this is great. The chat box, there's a lot of information sharing going on. A lot of questions coming in the Q&A box, so keep it coming. We'll try to get to as many as we can. But Jessica, one of the questions that I'm seeing a lot of, um, a lot of questions coming in about curriculum. How do you pick a curriculum? Um, where do you even start? So we'll okay. start with that. Okay, that's a great question. So um, how I kind of found my curriculum was word of mouth, and I'm going to reference this a lot, is, is Facebook groups. Um, a lot of times this time of year, if you kind of start searching, um, a lot of like local churches or like big, big open areas um, at like swap meets have homeschool swaps. And you can kind of talk to people and buy used curriculums that way. I've done that a couple times in a couple different areas um, to go to these big, like, swap, use book kind of sales um, and look through what the, what the stuff is. Um, a lot of homeschool curriculums could fall into um, either secular or non-secular. So that's just a, a personal preference, what you would prefer. But you can start researching these things. I'm a big researcher. I love throwing things out there, asking like 20 friends what they think of something. Um, so you kind of need to know your child first. Um, can they sit through a bunch of worksheets or do they need something that kind of stimulates them? Do they need um, sort of a non-traditional approach or, you know, is a workbook going to be okay? Um, so you'll start to kind of realize that. And then as you're reading through what um, curriculums are out there is best for your kid. And then you can also kind of mix and match things um, when it comes down to curriculum. You can make your own. Um, especially with the elementary school kids, you can, you know, print off worksheets. Uh, teachers Pay Teachers is a great website where you can print off things to, um, for your kids to do. A lot of them are free. You can filter it by free. Or you can get box curriculum, which is like, here you go. I have this curriculum day one, week one. You're going to say this, say this to your child and give them this worksheet. And that's when homeschooling really becomes a little more tangible and real. And they're like, oh, I can do this. It's not so much, are you smart enough to do this? Do you remember how to do long division? They're just giving you the tools to do it. So um, I would start with Facebook groups and, um, and kind of knowing your child's learning style and then narrow it down from there what curriculum might work best for them if you're going you know, a more traditional route with homeschooling. Okay, great. And then another question to kind of bounce off of that. So once the curriculum's been chosen or while they're still looking for curriculum, how do they know, I guess for their, our older um, kids that are being homeschooled, that this curriculum will be acceptable to a college or um, a university? Okay, great, great question. So what I would do, um, what I actually did is we did a, um, like a blended approach with a charter school. So this charter school was very hands-off. We got to use whatever curriculum 
um, we wanted, but we had the accountability of somebody checking in with us once a month and then they generated a report card and it was very generic. It was sort of like a, a one, two, three sort of system, but we were able to um, keep that to kind of turn it in for a little more continuity when we went to a public school system. The same thing for um, if you're just using a regular curriculum, a lot of these these curriculums that you would get these days have sort of a self-reporting report card. And you will want to keep that and you would, schools can kind of trans, you know, transfer that into a grade card. So you really just need to keep track of everything. If you do a charter school, they will provide you something which is like a report card that you can give to a, a public school system later down the road. Um, but you just want to make sure that you're recording everything don't inflate anything as far as grade, just be honest and report, you know, you know as, as much as you can, as honestly as you can about your child. Okay, and then a lot of questions were coming in about um, grading their, their work. How do you grade your, your kids' work? And then um, how do you, do you, when you pick curriculum, to kind of bounce off that question again too, and it's kind of a double question. Um, when you're picking the curriculum, how do you, can you use the same curriculum for the same group of children? So if you have a second grader and a fourth grader, do you have to buy separate packages? Yes, so if you're doing um, two different grades, you would have to buy two different curriculums specific for that grade. Now you could use the same one. Um, I'll just, uh, we used a Becca and you can use that, um, but you would have to buy it again for um, the two separate grades. Uh, there's some things that you might be able to keep, but even if you were going to use that again, um, you might need to use worksheets and things like that. Now, we also use a different one for kindergarten, um, but that was a lot of like creativity, add in your own things as well. Um, so you'll have to buy things probably over. Um, there's some things that you can use, and then you might need to pick two different completely things for different kids, depending on um, you know, how your, your child learns. Okay, great. Thank you. Lots of great questions coming in. So keep it up. And again, uh, to the group out there, if we're unable to get to all of the questions on this, because there are a lot on curriculum, um, please make sure to check out our USO Facebook group uh, later on, and we can definitely get a thread going there as well. Um, a lot of people in the call right now have little ones at home, so pre-K, uh, and they wanna know what kind of tips do you have for them getting them ready in a homeschool environment right now um, and getting them ready for kindergarten at, a, at another date? Yeah, that's a great question. Whether it's just the, the pre-K or you have the pre-K um, in conjunction with the older ones that you're trying to teach, I would get them involved if they were going to um, like a, a, a preschool center or, you know, some kind of transitional school, getting them ready for kindergarten, give them some independence and get them involved. Um, one thing that we like to do was we would do like um, a little exercise before we started. And these are all like silly things that you can incorporate to get them kind of mentally stimulated and kind of all the jitters out. So I'm going to throw these two out for you guys. It's um, Cosmic Kids Yoga. So it's a YouTube channel and you get on and they do like crazy Star Wars yoga and they think it's hilarious, but they're stretching and they're getting their mind stimulated. Um, I also like the Let's Get Fit um, by Jack Hartman. And again, it's another um, YouTube thing and you can get on there and they're like, okay, do jumping jacks by counting by twos. So they're learning how to count, they're learning how to skip counts um, and they're getting some exercise and that kind of gets, you know, maybe a good 30, 45 minutes out of them while they're um, getting some exercise and stimulated before you go into something. Uh, just get them involved, um, give them a task. Um, I think my four-year-old is a lot like, um, like, like a dog or something. If you don't have her give her a task, she's just gonna do whatever she wants. You know, you have to give her something to do or she's gonna find something to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. No problem. A lot of people are loving Cosmic Kids, so we're going to have to check this out. Oh, so fun. Okay. Um, we have a question um, from Tracy. It says, what is the advice, what is advice for parents with one child who struggles to stay focused? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's some, um, 
some things you can do. I know one, one tip I got, and um, I got this from my sister because she's a, she is a teacher. So, you know, I pick her brain all the time. Um, she would get like a timer and put it over um, and send base learning stickers, um, give them something to work towards. I'm going to give you another sticker. Um, if you can get through this, you know, make it a game, make it a contest. Um, if they're getting bored or, you know, they have like, um, you know, they're hyper, you know, they need, they're not focused or anything. We would always stop and just like take a break and we reconvene, um, whether it's just a walk around the neighborhood, um, something like that, because you're just going to get, they're just going to get more deflated if you're going to try and push through. Um, so again, that four hour day turns into almost a little bit longer, um, like a regular school day, because you have to take breaks and, and give them a chance to, you know, have a break. <laughs> Absolutely. And another question coming in, this one's from Vanessa. Um, she said, I hear we'll go through lots of ink with homeschooling. What is the cheapest, <laughs> where is the cheapest place to buy printer ink? And then another question and on to that is where is the best place just to get school supplies for homeschooling? Okay. Um, I know there's like a supply depot. I actually just got a magazine for it the other day. I can go ahead and put that in the Facebook group um, after this. So I'll send you guys some links. Um, as far as ink, I would say Amazon. Um, now there's also, and maybe we can get to this later, um, there are some avenues where you can try and get some funding as well. So that might offset some of this. Um, but we can talk about that later. But I think Amazon's probably the quickest and the fastest. Um, the refillable kind of things, those are also um, good as well. And yes, yeah, so we use a lot of ink. <laughs> And then um, we have a question is, what do you do when you have one child with a learning disability, but then the rest of them are talented and gifted? What would you recommend this uh, family do for homeschooling? Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, my, um, my son, I have to work with him a lot harder than my daughter. And I think this is the beauty about homeschooling is I think people think you're going to sit down next to them for, you know, every single minute and teach them every single minute of the day, but that's not really the case. And especially because once they're a little bit older and they have a foundation, you're not starting from scratch. When you're at school, you'll learn a new concept and then you'll probably practice that concept for like a week. So sometimes I'll get my older daughter um, who might have a little bit easier time picking up something on a task. And then she's good to go. And she knows that she's awesome. I praise her that she's awesome. But then I can redirect that back to the one who might need a little bit more help. Um, you know, there's other ways to supplement with that too. Um, whether it's some online tutoring, there's some free tutoring for uh, military with tutor.com. You can use Philbin and Kuman as well um, to pay for sessions. But I, every kid's different. Um, so you're going to have to kind of see who needs your attention more. Um, definitely let the other ones know that you're here to help them. But I think most of the time they're just going to get stuck on something. You're going to have to help them and redirect them and push them through that. And then they're going to be, you know, able to work on it on their own. And you'll see really that you're there more to guide them, um, than to actually teach them. Can I ask a question about that? I have heard of people um, who hire tutors or teachers to actually homeschool their kids. Is that something that you've heard of? And I, I'd be curious to know your feelings about that. Yeah, so um, I had, I've used tutors with my children to supplement. Um, in 29 Palms, we used a teacher for reading um, and she ended up going to third grade reading at a sixth grade level. So obviously we were doing something right. Um, my son this past year, we did tutoring um, with Sylvan online through Zoom to help supplement. So it wasn't a hundred percent, but I know that teachers are probably out there. They, they might be doing that on the side. Um, I, I heard some really interesting setups of how people are going through this, especially the working family. Um, you know, setting up cameras while mom's at school and turning off the Wi-Fi and you're, you know, I see you on the webcam kind of thing. I mean, whatever you have to do, um, that's why I'm saying this is not just traditional homeschooling. This is like survival, alternative learning for the pandemic fittest. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's lots of ways. I mean, if you need to hire a tutor, then 
do what you're going to do so to keep you sane as well. We definitely supplemented. How did you go about finding a tutor? Is there a, a place that you would go or was it sort of word of mouth or did you know teacher friends? What, what, how, how, how did you find somebody? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, so in 29 Palms, I think I got on like a care.com and they have a tutor section there. Um, and we kind of went through that and we found a tutor. Um, and you know, they taught there in the school district and they did this on the side. And then here, um, I, we, again, we did the same thing. And then we needed something that was a little more structured. So then that's when we just, we did still then. I think um, one of the resources we've heard, and, and I'm, I'm doing this from Tampa, Florida, in Hillsborough County, uh, I've, I've got neighbors who are teachers and her school, what my, my next door neighbor, her school doesn't need her this year because they don't have enough kids coming back. So she is offering up her services as a digital teacher. Um, I don't know how she's advertising it, but I would, I would advise everybody who's sort of put feelers out and see if there are teachers in your area who are willing to do some digital learning with your kids this year as well. Okay, I, I totally hijacked that from Nicole and Trish. Do we want to go back to the Q&A box? Because I don't see it getting any smaller. <laughs> Yeah, no, these are great. I'm loving it. I'm loving no it. No problem. And we have a lot of curriculum questions still coming in. So um, I'll just kind of start going down the list again. But uh, Emily wants to know, is there an average cost associated with homeschooling curriculums? And apologize if you've touched on some of this. Um, we're, we're just getting a lot of questions about this. So we'll, okay, we'll start yeah. there. No worries. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're going to use your own curriculum and you're just, you know, deciding I, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if they're going to school, if they're not going to school, if they're the A schedule, the B schedule, if they're going in January or whatever, and you're just gonna completely homeschool them. Curriculum can get pricey. Like that's why I mentioned earlier that um, you can find these used, um, these used uh, like swap meet kind of things, these co-op groups. I was online and just like everything else that exists on Facebook and online, you can find these um, homeschool, these homeschool um, curriculum groups where you can swap things, you see them come up and you kind of start learning what you need. Um, so, I mean, it does cost money if you, and it, it could get pricey. Um, like a, a box curriculum that we used was probably like $900. But if you think about that, that really is small when you're thinking about all the lunches and all the field trips and all the box of tissues you need to buy for your child over the course of the year. So it's a little bit more upfront, but then you have everything you need. It's just your child. You're not supplying the whole, you know, classroom with things and all these, you know, field trips that come up and stuff. So there are some, I think, hidden costs on both sides when you're looking at public school and homeschooling. And then, um, you know, there's some resources that you can use to sort of offset them. Can we talk a little bit more about those resources? I mean, I somebody who registered ahead of time asked if you can use a 529 plan to help pay for homeschooling. Um, I, I happened to Google it because I was curious and, and the answer is yes. So what are some other things that parents can do to offset those costs? Yeah, so um, much like everything in the military community, we're a tribe and um, I reached out to my, my uh, contacts and other branches and I know for sure that the Army um, has just stood up a sort of like an emergency relief thing for homeschooling specifically. And I'm really excited about this one because they're going to continue to keep this for homeschoolers that do traditional homeschooling after the pandemic. So if you ever need anything like that, um, you will need to talk with your army relief. I believe the Coast Guard has something um, as well. And then the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society doesn't necessarily have something homeschool specific, but due to the pandemic and everything that's going on right now, if you are feeling financial burdens because of the pandemic, then you might also qualify for an emergency grant or quick assist loan. Um, so those are some resources on base you can go to with your spouse, get some you know, cash right there to help with school. Um, the other route that you could go is, and now this doesn't exist in every state, this is specific, but what we did in California is we went through a charter school and that charter school gave us a grant each semester to use towards our curriculum for our manipulatives, supplies. Um, we bought subscriptions like little passports, all these sorts of things to kind of supplement with our homeschool experience. So here we are getting to use our own curriculum 
were getting money through this charter school, they were pretty hands off, but then we also still had the accountability and report card to kind of keep us on track. So that it was so perfect for us. Um, and you might want to look into charter schools in your area as well. You might have grant options. This is all very, very helpful. Thank you so much, Jessica. And again, there's lots of information sharing in the chat box, which we love to see. So highly encourage connecting with other uh, families out there that are going through the same thing. Um, and if you do want to reach out to somebody, you just simply click on their name in the chat box and you can send them a message directly. So wanted to throw that out there, but I'm going to the top of the list on the questions again. And uh, here's a question. What's the best way to create a schedule when you have a variety of learners and grade levels? So we've got a fifth, sixth, seventh, and ninth grader. Okay. Um, so I would have a binder for each child. Um, to kind of keep you accountable for what each one's learning. And then I like dry erase boards. I love whiteboards. I like to kind of see what's going on. So what I did is I went to um, Home Depot and bought like the big whiteboard and then put um, my own trim around it. I made this huge, like cheap, do-it-yourself whiteboard. And I would just divide it down for each day and kind of put what we're going to do. I could see that... Um, so actually here in my, in my living room too, I have a huge bay window. So when pandemic hit in um, March, I got dry erase markers and I just started scribbling like a mad scientist all over this huge, it's like, it's like our front bay window. And my husband like comes in and I have like just lesson plans everywhere, but I was very visual. And then the kids could see what was expected. It kept me on task, the kids would check it off. So with someone with multiple kids, I would say put the information out there so it's common knowledge to everyone um, and then maybe keep everything separate as, as far as a, a binder or some sort of um, their actual work. Great, I love that. Just giving me all kinds of ideas. <laughs> I know it was crazy. I had markers everywhere. Everyone, everything was written all over my windows. <laughs> oh my gosh, just to be walking by your house um, on an afternoon seeing you just Writing on the window. I love that. Okay. Um, so Lindsay is asking, I'm nervous about doing this homeschool because I'm in grad school. I have a sixth grader, kindergartner, and a preschooler. How can I make this flexible around my schedule? Oh my goodness, girl, I'm in grad school too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, coffee, um, you know, I, I think that we overthink things and then we just do it, right? We're all have a common, um, you know, a common commonality here of being military spouses. So it's like, how am I going to move to Japan? Well, we just, you know, we start learning and figuring it out and we reach out to people. Um, I know that this is just a season. Um, I'm not sure where you are in your grad school. I'll be done in four weeks. Thank you, Jesus. But, um, you know, there's, there's things that we can do. I, I usually have like um, my grad school pulled up and my work pulled up and then the kids are doing homework too. So I try and do school, or I try and multitask. Um, we try and make it um, kind of like a family event, but I think the reality is I'm doing school a lot when the kids are sleeping. Um, and that's just the sacrifice that I'm making right now. And I'm sure you can really, um, thank you. Thank you, I see the chat. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, my kids are 10, eight and four, um, working full time from home and in grad school. So, I mean, it can be done. It's not pretty. My husband's here, you know, he, he helps out and we're kind of going back and forth. So we're blessed to have, um, you know, flexible work. Um, and I, I'm hoping that there's something that everyone here has some sort of support, whether it's flexible work or a helpful neighbor um, or just genius children, you know, I'm hoping that someone has, um, you know, catches a break through all of this. Thank you for that. Um, Katie is asking, how do you, and you, you, again, you might've touched on this earlier, but how do you track grades, attendance and stake requirements in a highly mobile, mobile, <laughs> mobile lifestyle full of international and cross country PCSs? Mm -hmm. So you're probably gonna start um, where you land. Most school districts require about 180 days of instructional learning. Um, so as long as you hit that 180 days, especially if you're doing an, a more traditional homeschool approach, you can kind of hit that as fast or as, as slow as you want. Um, you can kind of stay on that, you know, 
September to May or August to June kind of thing, um, or you know, stretch it out a little bit, do a year around schooling. So as far as accountability with days off and stuff, um, I would say you have a little more flexibility when you're doing um, a homeschool approach that's um, more traditional that way. Um, because that's the beauty of homeschooling is you, you're flexible. Um, you have a little more say of, of your schedule. So um, and people in the chat can correct me if I'm wrong. Most of the time it's 180 days. You're doing some kind of instruction um, every day. And some days it might be a little more um, than others, but just try and do that every day um, and you'll keep yourself um, accountable. I, I printed off the calendar and again, I would put it in um, the kids binders and I would just check off that we did that day. And then I would start seeing if we were getting behind or not and try and double up on a day, work on a Saturday, work through, you know, uh, Labor Day or something, you know, we weren't doing anything that weekend. Um, or we, some, some summers we would start earlier um, and we would do a slow start. We're like, okay, we're gonna start um, at the end of July, but we're only gonna do two days a week and then two days a week and then three days a week and ease into it. So then by the time September comes, we're a little bit ahead and we got a little bit of a jump start. But, um, and we're not as overwhelmed, we're kind of easing the kids back into school. Um, and then that way we're getting ahead on our um, attendance and things like that. Great, okay. And then Jenny wants to know, is there a list of certain topics and subjects by grade of what they need to know by the end of the school year? Yes, so I was actually really concerned about that too. Like they need to know exactly what to do by what grade. And the truth is it's gonna vary from state to state because here in Virginia, they're gonna be learning, you know, Virginia history for their SOLs. Um, and that's not gonna be the case in California. But you can go, I mean, again, like on Pinterest or Google and like um, type in like third grade milestones, you know, by the end of the year. And it's gonna be very general things. Like skip counting by twos, um, you know, division, uh, blend, letter, letter vowels and, um, things of that nature. So then most of the time, your curriculum is going to already kind of um, think about that for you, which is nice because you don't have to think about as much if you're getting like a complete curriculum. So, um, so yeah, you're going to, you're going to be able to kind of do that a little bit. I got, I got thrown off track there. <laughs> and we're coming back to some more curriculum okay. questions. So Christy wants to know, do most states require you to submit the curriculum um, that you plan to use for approval? Okay, um, y yes and no. I, states don't um, require what, curricul what curriculum you're gonna do, but more states are more involved in your choice to homeschooling or not. For example, Texas, you can just homeschool your kids in the middle, you know, in the basement, never tell anybody, and Texas will never ask you like, where is your child? There's other states where you will have to you know, fill out a form, let them know that your child is homeschooled. Um, other states, you have to, you know, say I'm um, registering my house as the Rudd Homeschool Academy, and um, that is your homeschool. And you're just kind of letting the school know or the state know what you're doing. Um, they don't really need to know what curriculum, what curriculum you're doing. But if anyone ever feels like um, someone's asking what you're teaching your child or something like that, they don't really need to know. And um, a resource that I would throw out there is the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Um, it's a huge organization that supports homeschooling and kind of lets you know what your rights are. So um, if, you, if you were interested in those sort of leg um, legalities and things like that, I would write that down as a resource. Great, I'll find that for everybody and put that link in the chat box. And you said it's the Homeschool Legal Defense Association? Yep. Great, okay, excellent. Um, then Michelle, it kind of bounces off the, the state question, but do you have to find curriculum specific to your current state's testing requirements? Um, I guess I don't really know um, because we moved here in Virginia the first year that my daughter was going to be taking a state test. Um, now I do know that you can teach you can elect to have your kids take the state testing, even if you're homeschooling 100% um, on your own, which I would actually recommend because they're eventually gonna wanna take an ACT or an SAT. So you should kind of jump in on those opportunities because it really, you know, people like standardized testing, I get it, I get it. But as a homeschooler, 
I felt like that was a good way to kind of keep me accountable. Is my, is my student and my, and my child learning what they should be? Are they on track? So those options are still there for you. So you can kind of tailor it a little more and see, I mean, you can pick up like the Virginia, uh, I'm sure you can buy that, that curriculum online too. It's, it's not, um, these things aren't sold just to schools. You can actually buy them for yourself. Um, so you can kind of see what those are. And, and as we're in Virginia, you can look up the, the SOLs and it's gonna tell you exactly what your child's gonna need to know. Um, and those are tests that they can take. So they don't really need to um, teach for the, for the test or the state, but um, if you have the opportunity, I would, I would actually kind of see where the child is and, and take the test. Great. Okay, and then Tracy wants to know, how do you balance the social, social interaction with peers for the children? Social interaction with peers. Um, so, I mean, we did the homeschool co-op where, you know, they're seeing other kids, they're playing, um, they play with other kids in the, in the neighborhood. Um, I think that socialization, as many homeschool mamas and, and parents would get, like, fiercely defensive over because they're going to naturally... Um, be with other people. I would say like some of the middle school age kids make them volunteer. They're done with school for the day. So task them out to go to, you know, a nursing home, something like that. They're getting more life skills and um, social interaction with other people, like doing things for them and having like a, a servant kind of relationship and volunteering at a young age versus, you know, running around the neighborhood but I'm sure there's other kids out there too right now that are also homeschooled um I, like I said a co-op is a great way to get involved and try and find other kids for them to play with um and then probably you know look into your your local base and stuff too if there's any kind of groups but they're going to run into kids um you can definitely keep them socialized see what kind of things are going on on base Perfect. And then Maggie just asked, uh, how about homeschooling while stationed overseas? Do you report your progress to DODIA? I actually don't know that question. What I do know is every base has a school liaison and more specifically, they might even have like a homeschool liaison. So in 29 Palms, we worked really closely with the um, school liaison out there and they were really big supporters. We would go to their um, like back to school summer bash um, and they would have us on base as a um, non like DOD group come on base to help. So I really don't know the answer for that, but every base has a school liaison. So I would start there and see what the requirements are for homeschooling. Cause I'm more than likely it's gonna fall under some kind of um, DOD guidelines, kind of, you know, US kind of CONUS stuff. Perfect. And then Franchon's asking, we chose GA Cyber Academy. However, we still want to include more electives and things that interest them. What are good websites, resources that are affordable? <laughs> All right. Y'all are going to write this down. It's called Homeschooling with Netflix. It's a Facebook group and it has the coolest things. And it's like, oh, uh, you know, George Washington and this it, this holiday is coming up and then everyone throws in like these documentaries that are like kid friendly for them to watch. So it's super funny, but homeschooling with Netflix. Um, that's just something you can get on and be like, I wonder if there's something about this and you could probably find it and search the group. Um, one thing that we did, and I also saw um, earlier about, especially because of rural areas, so looking for supplements, looking for things where you might not have a lot of resources or museums or things to go to, is these subscription boxes. We did little passports, so the kids always thought it was so cool to get um, things in the mail. We got um, a little chef's thing too, and again, we're using our grant money to do this. Um, so we like subscribe to every single, single subscription that you can imagine to. Um, so we're getting like home chef things for the kids to cook, um, all of these little boxes. And it, and it was fun for them. It was mail. Um, it was something in addition to, um, we would again, get on teachers pay teachers and these are all free things. And we would print off worksheets to do M&M &M math. And, um, the kids would think it's hilarious and they're doing math and they're eating M&Ms. So all of those things you can just throw in. Um, just for fun and it's for free and that's also when the ink comes in and you got to print stuff 
But um, there's all these other things you can add to your nice, pretty, you know, structured curriculum to, to give it a more fun feel to do these things. We ordered butterflies and we hatched butterflies from the house. Um, so there's all these fun things that you can do um, to kind of make it your own. I want to be one of your students. This sounds like so much fun. I want to do M&M math. I want to hatch butterflies. Sign me up. This sounds yeah, great. I got my daughter up um, in toilet paper, so it would be like a cocoon, and then she had to try and get out of it. So, I mean, we had some, we had some fun times for sure. I love it. Well, um, I'm going to do a couple more questions because we're almost at time and then Liz, I'll, I'll let you take over. But um, we have another question. So you talked about where you do your typical day um, when you do your homeschooling and where you prefer to do it. But um, we have a question. Is it good to create a school corner or should I allow them to study wherever? I personally prefer everyone in one spot. Yeah, and I think that's a great um a great point is what you said at the end is everyone in one spot. So if you have the space, do it. I started off doing it that way. Um, I had bought like a little table from Amazon and I put, you know, the alphabet up and stuff and we were in a bedroom and, and it was small and I just felt really um, confined in there. So we ended up sort of just naturally moving out to the kitchen um, and everyone was out there. And then the TV was also around the corner. So, you know, all else fails, the little ones watching something, um, or I can also start lunch while they were working. Um, so everyone is in sort of a common area. Um, and so that's what I would suggest. Do whatever works best for you. If you have a space that's like amazing and you've done all this stuff and that's really hands-on, I, I, I wish I could come there and, and do school. But um, for us, I think that you're right. The main thing was we needed to be together. So um, the area where we did it gave me the ability to start lunches and have someone else watching TV, but we were all still, you know, within eyes of each other. So that worked for us. We could do more at once. Okay, good. And then this will be one of my last questions and then I'll hand it over to Liz. Bri is asking, how does homeschooling work with a student that has a IEP, so an individualized education program? So, you know, that's something that I was actually adventuring in. We were in the middle of an IEP and we were supposed to follow up with the final IEP in May and everything got put on hold. So um, I think I know who this person is specifically, and I honestly don't know. Um, I know that there's resources out there through the different school districts to help. Um, again, things that we kind of did on our own was we did additional um, tutoring through Sylvan to try and keep him engaged, to give him a little more structure, me a little more support. Um, so don't feel afraid to ask for resources because no one's going to think that, um, you know, you, you, you might need help, you might need some guidance, you might need to have a tutor come in, um, you know, once a week or do a set time for 30 minutes every day. So I'm not 100% sure, but we were in the middle of that and we don't have answers because, because of all of this. So um, I guess I kind of empathize with you. And if you find out anything, let me know too. <laughs> Great. And I'll hand it back over to Liz. Thanks, Jess. Um, thank you so much, Nicole. That was awesome. I feel like I got off easy tonight. Um, and, and Jessica, you could probably see me. I was over here while you're answering, writing this stuff down because even though our kids are supposed to be going back to school, I'm dying right now working full time and I don't know what to do with them. So I'm like, cosmic kids, let's get fit. Subscription boxes, homeschooling, like my kids will need this stuff right now, even before summer's over. So thank you for that. And, and yeah. shout out to all the parents who are doing this right now, because we know there's, there's no easy way to, to do this right now with the kids at home. Um, we wanted to let everyone know that because this was such a popular topic, as soon as we put it out into the universe, we had so many people sign up. We're adding an encore live version of this again on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we know that our folks at USO Europe were really interested in getting this available for the European uh, military families or, or U.S. military families in Europe. So again, 2 p.m. on Monday, Eastern time, we will be here again live with Jessica to continue answering questions. Many of the same questions might come up and there might be some new ones. So if you're able to join us, I believe Trisha and Nicole are going to put that information in the box to register. Um, also next Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to be talking on Coffee Connections Live 
with Heidi Murkoff, who's the author of the What to Expect series. We'll be talking all things pregnancy and parenthood. So be sure to join us for that one as well. Jessica, in closing, do you have any final thoughts or any remarks for the group or any, any other resources or anything you'd like to share? Um, no, you just really don't know what you're capable of until you just do it. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to um, you know, send them our way and I can try and help. Um, uh, I'll continue the conversation afterwards in the group. Um, but we're in this together. It doesn't matter how you're home, you're doing your kids. Um, I'm just a big ad advocate of military child education in general. Um, nobody, you know, a homeschool family um, has never been told that they have to go to public school. So in the reciprocal, we're being told, you know, do school at home. It's a little challenging, but I think I've seen so many people who have homeschool experience kind of reach out and say, look, you got this. It's hard. I know it's hard and no one's ever asked you to do this, but um, if anything, if any of this was a little bit helpful and you could take something away from it, um, just know that we're all in the same boat. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and remember that we are one big military community. We help each other. This is what we do. Uh, for those who've been asking, we will be continuing this conversation in the USO Military Spouse Facebook group. It's a, a private group, but you can find it and join it. I know the link is in the chat box. And if you join it right now, in about five minutes after we finish this, we'll open up a post where you can comment on there. People can share links and resources to continue helping each other with this whole topic of homeschooling and e-learning. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And for all of you who joined with us tonight, Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for doing what you can do for your kids. We know they're gonna be amazing military kids no matter what. There's no right answer, but you're all getting it right. Thank you all so much for being here and have a wonderful night.